This is a recording of the Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams. Scene 1. The Wingfield apartment is in the rear of the building, one of those vast hive-like conglomerations of cellular living units that flower as warty growths in overcrowded urban centers of lower middle class population and are symptomatic of the impulse of this largest and fundamentally enslaved section of American society to avoid fluidity and differentiation and to exist and function as one interfused mass of automatism. The apartment faces an alley and is entered by a fire escape, a structure whose name is a touch of accidental poetic truth. For all of these huge buildings are always burning with the slow and implacable fires of human desperation. The fire escape is part of what we see, that is, the landing of it and steps descending from it. The scene is memory and is therefore non-realistic. Memory takes a lot of poetic license. It omits some details. Others are exaggerated according to the emotional value of the articles it touches. For memory is seated predominantly in the heart. The interior is therefore rather dim and poetic. At the rise of the curtain, the audience is faced with the dark, grim rear wall of the Wingfield tenement. This building is flanked on both sides by dark, narrow alleys which run into murky canyons of tangled clotheslines, garbage cans, and the sinister latticework of neighboring fire escapes. It is up and down these side alleys that exterior entrances and exits are made during the play. At the end of Tom's opening commentary, the dark tenement wall slowly becomes transparent and reveals the interior of the ground floor Wingfield apartment. Nearest the audience is the living room, which also serves as a sleeping room for Laura, the sofa unfolding to make her bed. Just beyond, separated from the living room by a wide arch or second proscenium with transparent faded portieres or second curtains is the dining room. In an old-fashioned whatnot in the living room are seen scores of transparent glass animals. A blown-up photograph of the father hangs on the wall of the living room to the left of the archway. It is the face of a very handsome young man in a doughboy's first World War cap. He is gallantly smiling, ineluctably smiling as if to say, I will be smiling forever. Also hanging on the wall near the photograph are a typewriter keyboard chart and a Greg shorthand diagram. An upright typewriter on a small table stands beneath the charts. The audience hears and sees the opening scene in the dining room through both the transparent fourth wall of the building and the transparent gaze portieres of the dining room arch. It is during these revealing scene that the fourth wall slowly ascends out of sight. This transparent exterior wall is not brought down again until the very end of the play, during Tom's final speech. The narrator is an undisguised convention of the play. He takes whatever license with dramatic convention is convenient to his purposes. Tom enters dressed as a merchant sailor and strolls across to the fire escape. There he stops and lights a cigarette. He addresses the audience. Tom. Yes, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things up my sleeve. But I am the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth. I give you truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. To begin with, I turn back time. I reverse it to that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of American... America was matriculating in a school for the blind. Their eyes had failed them, or they had failed their eyes, and so they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down on the fiery braille alphabet of a dissolving economy. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion. In Spain, there was Guernica. Here, they were disturbances of labor, sometimes pretty violent in otherwise peaceful cities such as Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis. This is the social background of the play. Music begins to play. The play is memory. Being a memory play, it is dimly lighted. 
It is sentimental. It is not realistic. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. That explains the fiddle in the wings. I am the narrator of the play and also a character in it. The other characters are my mother, Amanda, my sister, Laura, and a gentleman caller who appears in the final scenes. He is the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. But since I have a poet's weakness for symbols, I am using this character also as a symbol. He is the long delayed, but always expected something that we live for. There is a fifth character in the play who doesn't appear except in this larger than life size photograph over the mantle. This is our father who left us a long time ago. He was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances. He gave up his job with the telephone company and skipped the light fantastic out of town. The last we heard of him was a picture postcard from a Mazalan on the Pacific coast of Mexico containing a message of two words, hello, goodbye, and no address. I think the rest of the play will explain itself. Amanda's voice becomes audible through the portieres. Legend on screen, au sont les dénégiers. Thomas divides the portieres and enters the dining room. Amanda and Laura are seated at a drop leaf table. Eating is indicated by gestures without food or utensils. Amanda faces the audience. Tom and Laura are seated in profile. The interior has lit up softly, and through the scrim we see Amanda and Laura seated at the table. Amanda calling. Tom! Tom. Yes, Mother. Amanda. We can't say grace until you come to the table. Tom. Coming, Mother! He bows slightly and withdraws, reappearing a few moments later in his place at the table. Amanda to her son. Honey, don't push with your fingers. If you have to push with something, the thing to push with is a crust of bread. And chew, chew. Animals have secretions in their stomach which enable them to digest food without mastication. But human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down. Eat food leisurely, son, and really enjoy it. A well-cooked meal has lots of delicate flavors that have to be held in the mouth for appreciation. So, chew your food and give your salivary glands a chance to function. Tom deliberately lays his imaginary fork down and pushes his chair back from the table. Tom, I haven't enjoyed one bite of this dinner because of your constant directions on how to eat it. It's you that make me rush through meals with your hawk-like attention to every bite I take. Sickening. Spoils my appetite. All this discussion of animal secretion, salivary glands, mastication. Amanda, lightly. Temperament, like a metropolitan star. Tom rises and walks toward the living room. You're not excused from the table. Tom, I'm getting a cigarette. Amanda, you smoke too much. Laura rises. Laura, I'll bring in the Blanc Mange. Tom remains sit standing with his cigarette by the portieres. Amanda, rising. No, sister, no, sister. You be the lady this time, and I'll be the darky. Laura, I'm already up. Amanda, Resume your seat, little sister. I want you to stay fresh and pretty for the gentleman callers. Laura, sitting down. I'm not expecting any gentleman callers. Amanda, crossing out to the kitchenette airily. Sometimes they come when they're least expected. Why, I remember one Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain. She enters the kitchenette. Tom. I know what's coming, Laura. Yes, but let her tell it. Tom. Again? Laura. She loves to tell it. Amanda returns with a bowl of dessert. Amanda. One Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain, your mother received 17 gentlemen callers. Why, sometimes there weren't chairs enough to accommodate them all. We had to send the blank over to bring in folding chairs from the parish house. Tom. 
remaining at the portieres. How did you entertain those gentlemen callers? Amanda. I understood the art of conversation. Tom. I bet you could talk. Amanda. Girls in those days knew how to talk, I can tell you. Tom. Yes? Image on screen. Amanda is a girl on a porch greeting callers. Amanda. They knew how to entertain their gentlemen callers. It wasn't enough for a girl to be possessed of a pretty face and a graceful figure, although I wasn't slighted in either respect. She also needed to have a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions. Tom. What did you talk about? Amanda. Things of importance going on in the world. Never anything coarse or common or vulgar. She addresses Tom as though he were seated in the vacant chair at the table, though he remains by the portiers. He plays this scene as though reading from a script. My callers were gentlemen, all. Among my callers were some of the most prominent young planters of the Mississippi Delta. Planters and sons of planters. Tom motions for music and a spot of light on Amanda. Her eyes lift, her face glows, her voice becomes rich and elegant. Screen legend. All sont les négres d'un antion. There was a young champ, Lachlan, who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Hadley Stevenson, who was drowned in Moon Lake, was left and left his widow 150000 in government bonds. There were the Coulteré brothers, Wesley and Bates. Bates was one of my bright, particular beaux. He got in a quarrel with that wild Wainwright boy. They shot it out on the floor of Moon Lake Casino. Bates was shot through the stomach, died in the ambulance on his way to Memphis. His widow was also well provided for, came into eight or ten thousand acres, that's all. She married him on the rebound, never loved her, carried my picture on him the night he died. And there was that boy that every girl in the Delta had set her cap for, that beautiful, brilliant, young Fitzhugh boy from Greene County. Tom, what did he leave his widow? Amanda, he never married. Gracious, you talk as though all of my old admirers had turned up their toes to the daisies. Tom. Isn't this the first you've mentioned that still survives? Amanda. That Fitzhugh boy went north and made a fortune, came to be known as the Wolf of Wall Street. He had the Midas touch. Whatever he touched turned to gold. And I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh, mind you. But I picked your father. Laura rising. Mother, let me clear the table. Amanda. No, dear, you go in front and study your typewriter chart, or practice your shorthand a little. Stay fresh and pretty. It's almost time for our gentlemen callers to start arriving. She flounces girlishly towards the kitchenette. How many do you suppose we're going to entertain this afternoon? Tom throws down the paper and jumps up with a groan. Laura, alone in the dining room. I don't believe we're going to receive any, mother. Amanda reappearing airily. What? Not one? Not one? You must be joking. Laura nervously echoes her laugh. She slips into a fugitive manner, though the half-open portieres, and draws them gently behind her. A shaft of very clear light is thrown on her face against the faded tapestry of the curtains. Faintly, the music of the glass menagerie is heard as she continues lightly. Not one gentleman caller. It can't be true. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. Laura. It isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, mother. I'm just not popular like you were in Blue Mountain. Tom utters another groan. Laura glances at him with a faint apologetic smile. Her voice catches a little. Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid. The scene dims out with the glass menagerie music. Scene 2 On the dark stage, the screen is lighted with the image of blue roses. Gradually, Laura's figure becomes apparent with the screen goes out. The music subsides. Laura is seated in the delicate ivory chair at the small clawfoot table. 
She wears a dress of soft violet material for a kimono. Her hair is tied back from her forehead with a ribbon. She is washing and polishing her collection of glass. Amanda appears on the fire escape steps. At the sound of her ascent, Laura catches her breath, thrusts the bowl of ornaments away, and seats herself stiffly before the diagram of the typewriter keyboard as though it held her spellbound. Something has happened to Amanda. It is written in her face as she climbs to the landing, a look that is grim and hopeless and a little absurd. She has on one of those cheap or imitation velvety-looking cloth coats with imitation fur collar. Her hat is five or six years old, one of those dreadful cloak hats that were worn in the late twenties, and she is clutching an enormous black patent leather pocketbook with nickel clasps and initials. This is her full dress outfit, the one she is usually wears to the DAR. Before entering, she looks through the door. She purses her lips, opens her eyes very wide, rolls them upward, and shakes her head. Then she slowly lets herself in the door. Seeing her mother's expression, Laura touches her lips with a nervous gesture. Laura, hello, mother, I was... She makes a nervous gesture towards the chart on the wall. Amanda leans against the shut door and stares at Laura with a martyred look. Amanda, deception? Deception? She slowly removes her hat and gloves, continuing the sweet, suffering stare. She lets the hat and gloves fall on the floor, a bit of acting. Laura, shakily. How was the DAR meeting? Amanda slowly opens her purse and removes a dainty white handkerchief, which she shakes out delicately and delicately touches to her lips and nostrils. Didn't you go to the DAR meeting, Mother? Amanda, faintly, almost inaudibly. No, no, then more forcibly. I did not have the strength to go to the DAR. In fact, I do not have the courage. I wanted to find a hole in the ground and hide myself in it forever. She crosses slowly to the wall and removes the diagram of the typewriter keyboard. She holds it in front of her for a second, staring at it sweetly and sorrowfully, then bites her lips and tears it in two pieces. Laura, faintly. Why did you do that, mother? Amanda repeats the same procedure with the chart of the Grig alphabet. Why are you? Amanda. Why, why? How old are you, Laura? Laura. Mother, you know my age. Amanda. I thought that you were an adult. It seems that I was mistaken. She crosses slowly to the sofa and sinks down and stares at Laura. Laura. Please don't stare at me, mother. Amanda closes her eyes and lowers her head. There is a ten-second pause. Amanda, what are we going to do? What is going to become of us? What is the future? There is another pause. Laura, has something happened, Mother? Amanda draws a long breath, takes out the handkerchief again, goes through the dabbing process. Mother! Has something happened? Amanda. It'll be all right in a minute. I'm just bewildered. She hesitates. By life. Laura. Mother, I wish that you would tell me what's happened. Amanda. As you know, I was supposed to be inducted into my office at the DAR this afternoon. Screen image. A swarm of typewriters. But I stopped off at... Rubicam's business college to speak to your teachers about your having a cold and ask them what process they thought you were making down there. Laura. Oh, Amanda. I went to the typing instructor and introduced myself as your mother. She didn't know who you were. Wingfield, she said. Why don't we don't have any such student enrolled at the school? I assured her she did that you had been going to classes since early in January. I wonder, she said, if you could be talking about that terribly shy little girl who dropped out of school after only a few days' attendance? 
No, I said, Laura, my daughter, has been going to school every day for the past six weeks. Excuse me, she said. She took the attendance book out, and there was your name, unmistakably printed, and all the dates you were absent until they decided that you had dropped out of school. I still said, no, there must have been some mistake. There must have been some mix-up in the records. And she said, no, I remember her perfectly now. Her hands shook so that she couldn't hit the right keys. The first time we gave a speed test, she broke down completely, was sick at the stomach, and almost had to be carried into the washroom. After that morning, she never showed up any more. We phoned the house, but never got any answer. While I was working at Famous Bar, I suppose, demonstrating those, she indicates a brassiere with her hands. Oh, I felt so weak I could barely keep on my feet. I had to sit down while they got me a glass of water. Fifty dollars tuition, all of our plans, my hopes and ambitions for you. Just gone up the spout. Just gone up the spout like that. Laura draws a long breath and gets awkwardly to her feet. She crosses to the Victrola and winds it up. What are you doing? Laura. Oh, she releases the handle and returns to her seat. Amanda. Laura, where have you been going when you've gone out pretending that you were going to business college? Laura, I've just been going out walking. Amanda, that's not true. Laura, it is. I just went walking. Amanda, walking? Walking? In winter? Deliberately courting pneumonia in that light coat? Where did you walk to, Laura? Laura, all sorts of places. Mostly in the park. Amanda. Even after you've started catching that cold? Laura. It was the lesser of two evils, mother. Screen image. Winter scene in a park. I couldn't go back there. I threw up on the floor. Amanda. From half past seven till after five every day, you mean to tell me you walked around in the park because you wanted to make me think that you were still going to Reuben Cam's business college? Laura. It wasn't as bad as it sounds. I went inside places to get warmed up. Amanda. Inside where? Laura. I went in the art museum and the bird houses at the zoo. I visited the penguins every day. Sometimes I did without lunch and went to the movies. Lately, I've been spending most of my afternoons in the jewel box, that big glass house where they raise the tropical flowers. Amanda, you did all this to deceive me just for deception? Laura looks down. Why? Laura, mother, when you're disappointed, you get that awful suffering look on your face, like the pictures of Jesus' mother in the museum. Amanda. Hush, Laura. I couldn't face it. There is a pause. A whisper of strings is heard. Legend on screen. The crust of humility. Amanda, hopelessly fingering the huge pocketbook. So what are we going to do the rest of our lives? Stay home and watch the parades go by? Amuse ourselves with the glass menagerie, darling? Eternally play those worn-out phonograph records your father left us as a painful reminder of him? We won't have a business career. We've given that up because it gave us nervous indigestion. She laughs wearily. What is there left but dependency all our lives? I know so well what becomes of unmarried women who aren't prepared to occupy a position. I've seen such pitiful cases in the South, barely tolerated spinsters living upon the grudging patronage of sisters, husbands, or brother's wife, struck away in some little mousetrap of a room, encouraged by one in-law to visit another, little bird-like women without any nest, eating the crust of humility all their life. Is that the future that we've mapped out for ourselves? I swear it's the only alternative I can think of. She pauses. It isn't a very pleasant alternative, is it? She pauses again. Of course, some girls do marry. Laura twists her hands nervously. Haven't you ever liked some boy? Laura. Yes, I liked one once. She rises. 
I came across his picture a while ago. Amanda, with some interest. He gave you his picture? Laura, no, it's in the yearbook. Amanda, disappointed. Oh, a high school boy. Screen image, Jim as the high school hero bearing a silver cup. Laura, yes, his name was Jim. She lifts the heavy annual from the clawfoot table. Here he is in the Pirates of Pen Penzance. Amanda, absently. The what? Laura, the operetta the senior class put on. He had a wonderful voice and we sat across the aisle from each other, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the odd. Here he is with the silver cup for debating. See his grin? Amanda, absently. He must have had a jolly disposition. Laura, he used to call me Blue Roses. Screen image, Blue Roses. Amanda, why did he call you such as that? Laura, when I had that attack of pleurosis, he asked me what was the matter when I came back. I said pleurosis. He thought I said blue roses. So that's what he always called me after that. Whenever he saw me, he'd holler, hello, blue roses. I didn't care for the girl that he went out with, Emily Meisenbach. Emily was the best dressed girl at Salden. She never struck me, though, as being sincere. It says in the personal section they're engaged. That's six years ago. They must be married by now. Amanda. Girls that aren't cut out for business careers usually wind up married to some nice man. She gets up with a sparkle of revival. Sister, that's what you'll do. Laura utters a startled, doubtful laugh. She reaches quickly for a piece of glass. Laura, but mother. Amanda, yes. She goes over to the photograph. Laura, in a tone of frightened apology. I'm crippled. Amanda, nonsense, Laura. I've told you never, never to use that word. Why, you're not crippled. You just have a little defect, hardly noticeable even. When people have some slight disadvantage like that, they cultivate other things to make up for it, develop charm, a vivacity, and charm. That's all you have to do. She turns again to the photograph. One thing your father had plenty of was charm. The scene fades out with music. <laughs>